It starts with the conviction that if enough of us work hard enough, social change is not only possible, it is inevitable. SVP Fast Pitch celebrates social innovation, heart, community, vision. More than a competition, it is a catalyst for the change we all want to see. Innovators solving the pressing social issues in our communities. Education, social justice, housing, youth empowerment, health. Change starts tonight. It is possible, it is inevitable, and the driving force is you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the SVP board chair, Mr. Bob Woods. All right, good evening. Let's do one more round of applause for all those great people that were on the video for past years. All right. I'm Bob Woods, I'm the board chair for SVP Seattle. I'm representing Sol McCurdy, our CEO, and all the great staff and volunteers that put together this great event. And we're excited to have you all here to celebrate with us all the innovators that are here presenting their stories about social impact in our region. Thank you for being here tonight, and we're excited to have over 300 of you here and a number of you that donated your time outside um, of the event tonight leading up to this great final showdown. Um, so first of all, I want to see who's new to this. Who's a frequent flyer that's, that has, is their first time being here at the showdown for the final time? Got several people here, first final showdown. Who's been here multiple times? This is my second time. Who's been here multiple times? Give yourselves a round of applause for continuing to support this great event. This is an exciting time to be part of a great event where we do social innovation on a rapid scale, helping so many different organizations get their story down and provide money to support it along with the coaching and the market. Um, for those that are new here, what is really SV, what is Fast Pitch? Fast Pitch is part of the reach that SVP Seattle has in terms of giving impact to the community through capacity building. Our focus is not just on the money, it's on the time and the value of coaching, mentoring, and bringing an impactful story into the, the Seattle and the Puget Sound region. We're really excited to have all the groups here and all the people that volunteer their time to help bring together thought leaders and into innovative solutions that are helping solve our community's most challenging problems. And that wouldn't happen without a number of people that volunteered. Who here in the room has volunteered as part of this? Can we give a round of applause to all those people? It's a phenomenal group of people that helped put this together. We had over 100 volunteers. We had two co-chairs, Natasha and Audra. Can we give them a round of applause for doing such a great work? And the phenomenal part of this, this is our eighth year doing this. We've given over $2 million to over 350 organizations of $2 million of time and money to help them sustain themselves and grow and mature to help the impact into the region. It's phenomenal. It would not happen with these people that are volunteering their time and their talent, and we really appreciate you joining with SVP to do that. Um, as we move forward, we wanted to thank a couple of groups as well that we wouldn't be here without. First, we want to thank our benefactor sponsors, BCU, GoDaddy and Premier Blue Cross. Can we give them a round of applause? Thanks to all the representatives for them. We also have a platinum sponsor, the Paul G. Allen Philanthropies. His, his uh, journey is living through us today and, and all the things that he wanted to do through Seattle and all the other silver and bronze sponsors that are represented today. We want to thank all of them. Let's give them a round of applause as well. So I've been up here just a couple minutes. We want to get to the innovators, right? We want to start hearing some really good stories? All right. So let's get past, let's get through this and get to our MC, get to the innovators, have them do their pitches, get the judges out here and start giving out some awards. Does that sound good? All right. Guys, please help me welcome our MC tonight, Marcus Hardin, a phenomenal social leader that's come and joined us all the way from Atlanta, establishing a new school for youth and living the kind of dream that we want to do through SVP Seattle and the, and the program tonight. Let's welcome him out here, guys. All right. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Oh, we got to do better. To, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Whoever, Somebody gave me one. Let's try it again. Good evening, everyone. How are you? There you go. 
We got to be excited about tonight. We have the opportunity to showcase and to be a part of. And, and tonight, we're going to have a great um, opportunity for all of us to become investors and innovators into some of these wonderful social projects. Um, as Bob said, I thank him for the great intro. Uh, my name is Marcus Harden. I'm actually a, a Seattle native. Um, I graduated from University of Washington right here twice. They have about $38,767.23 of my money. Um, <laughs> Give or take, carry the one or two. Um, and I'm just, I'm so proud and honored to be here and, and to be a social, uh, social justice warrior myself and somebody who really looks at what we do as SVP, at SVP, um, that is the incredible work to form organizations that help move forward our region and hopefully the world. Um, and so tonight we get the opportunity to showcase um, the tw 21 have moved forward since July to move this work forward. Tonight we get to showcase 11 that you'll get to see that will come forth and present all of the wonderful ideas and opportunities they've had throughout this last journey. They've spent hundreds of hours since July. They've had coaching and they've moved forward from there to be able to be here tonight. And so some of them I know are nervous. So when I came out here and we needed to push and move the energy, make sure we're giving them that great energy because every single one is worthy of millions and millions of dollars. They won't be getting that tonight, but but we have the opportunity to plant seeds and move forward the work. So um, now I have the pleasure of introducing the hardest jobs in the house tonight, and that is the judges, all right? So please welcome our panel of judges this evening. Together they hold decades of experience across the public and private sector. Um, they have focused on empowering our most underserved communities while creating opportunities for success and achievement. Um, they were selected as judges because they all bring different perspective and background and the final deliberations will be the portion where they will really have to earn their keep tonight. We are especially excited that a fast pitch winner, Veena Prasad from Project Feast, is joining us again, but sitting on the other side now. Innovators, she knows what it's like to be in your shoes. So we have our fantastic judges. Judges, if you can stand up and, give, and, and just give a quick wave. They have a personal security detail as well, just in case somebody doesn't like the results, so we'll be, we'll be good later. The judges will be listening to all of our pitches tonight and evaluating organizations based on the judging rubric. They'll be looking for impact, sustainability, innovation, advancement of race and equity leadership, business model, and finally, what we're all here for, the pitch. More details on judging criteria can be found in your program, so don't just throw that away. That's not one of the things you stuck underneath your seat and you never look at it again. This is an interactive program. So make sure you look in your program. Um, and we want to thank all of our judges for being a part of this night. Tonight is a platform for our innovators to tell their stories, but also at stake are over $100,000 in cash, grants, and prizes. While our judges will be decided the main winners, each and every one of you will have the opportunity to participate and support the innovators. As an audience member tonight, you have three ways to engage. Through Angel Awards, which are $250 checks will be raffled off throughout the evening to 10 audience members. Each of you will have the opportunity then to give an organization that you deem worthy the $250 angel check. I heard that there used to be angel wings that went with the angel checks. And while we are in the back and people are presenting, and if I can come across the wings and maybe somebody wants a pair, we'll give you one as a parting gift so you leave tonight with a pair of angel wings. Don't hold me to that, but we'll make sure we try. Um, angel Awards really represent the idea that you don't have to be rich to be a philanthropist. You can give and give and give, and we want to plant that seed here tonight. So we'll be a part of that. Um, every generation has the opportunity to make a difference, and tonight we will all be philanthropists. Our second one, once you've seen all the pitches on stage, you can cast your vote for your favorite by selecting the Audience Choice Award. This is for the nonprofit sector of our evening tonight. So the Audience Choice will give you more information about that. And finally, for the first time we've made this year, we've made it easy to donate to any of the 18 nonprofit organizations you want to hear from. Text to donate. Does everybody here have a cell phone? Anybody here have a pager? <laughs> Rotary phone. I, just, I really wanted to see the last two. It was for my personal enjoyment. Had not, this wasn't on the script. So, um, so if you want to text or donate tonight to give lively, we will. It's a simple process. Find the unique innovator code, once again in your program, innovative and, and, and interactive, and text that to 44. 
three, two, one. Uh, I don't know anybody who still charges for text rates. I hope everyone has unlimited text, and if not, we can talk later. Um, it will direct you to a special page. You can make a donation to that organization, and we'll show you the codes after each presentation. Lastly, social media. Um, if you have a pager or a flip phone, don't worry about this portion. But tonight, you want to share the experience that we have. So Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, Instagram, whatever else you have, use your Hootsuite, whatever else you need to do. Text uh, hashtag SVP, fast pitch. Let people know that there is the only one place to be tonight, and that's right here. So let them know the time they're missing. Um, hashtag and, and tag the groups that you enjoy. Hopefully you tag all of them, but really maybe push the ones that really speak to your heart. So again, use your social media tags tonight. Let folks know where we're at. Um, and with that, who's ready for some pitches? All right, first up, we will have our for-profit section. The for-profit section is a little bit different, and, and they will have the opportunity to come up and present and give you a, a different perspective. For these, they do not have to be in the region of Washington and necessarily serve. They can have a global impact. They'll show you a little bit more about their business plan and about their pushes forward, so it'll, it'll feel a little bit different than our um, established nonprofit and our nonprofit sections, but we want to give as much love and, and, and support to our for-profit sections. Um, and this group, was, they'll still be based here, but they have a global footprint, all right? So let's do it again. Let's get a little drum roll going if we can. All right. And with that, we want to work, welcome our first for-profit presenter, Circled In. Imagine a world where every child gets some higher education. Every talent gets discovered no matter where it comes from. Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon to change the world. And I'm using that force of education to create the world I crave. I'm Richie Gupta, founding CEO of CircleDing, an online holistic portfolio platform that helps every student showcase themselves, matches them with colleges and universities, leveling the playing field. I'm a live example of power of education. I started my life with a very humble beginning in late 70s in India, where 70% population could not read or write their own name. Only thing in my favor, a teacher mom. From a very young age of eight years, I helped her run an elementary school and taught kids who could not read otherwise. Knocking on doors, convincing people to send their kids to the school, put education deep in my DNA and pulled me up. I used to get one pencil every school year. But today, I can provide plenty to my two daughters. And while Raising those two daughters, what I found, we still have not given the power of education to every child. Kyra reminds me of my younger self, except for the teacher mom. Our current higher education system is leaving Kyra behind, and let me show you how. Every year, colleges have enrollment goals and equity and diversity goals for more holistic experience for everybody. So even before your students apply to colleges, Colleges spend billions of dollars and recruit kids on a very large scale. But what do they do? Very antiquated, insanely inefficient marketing techniques that starts by buying email lists from test agencies and then spamming those kids with these flyers that go directly from mailbox to the recycle bin. One day mail for two families, that's it. The whole process gives them 1% return. It hurts them when it costs them $2,500 to recruit one student, and they miss their goals. Without a good fit match, 60% graduation rate, losing proposition for both sides, students as well as colleges. As for Kyra, she never took the test, never came on radar, falls through cracks, loses opportunities. All because you and I have LinkedIn, there's no platform for Kyra where she can be found easily by colleges. Now, till now, let me show you how Circled In 
is disrupting this very market, bringing those Kairas on the platform and modernizing these techniques for everybody. For Kaira, it's a holistic portfolio platform. She creates her resume, but more in a modern day LinkedIn style. She compiles her holistic portfolio, showcases her holistic strengths and talents and passion. Once she's on the platform, we invest in her success. For universities like Eastern Washington University, it's bringing their recruitment to 21st century. They come find Kyra on the platform, connect with her. Just like LinkedIn revolutionized the corporate recruiting, we are doing the same with Circle Jane for college recruitment. We believe social good can be scalable and sustainable if it has a strong business case. And for Circle Lane, we have developed a very solid go-to-market strategy as well as business plan. We are starting in US, obvious reasons, but we will be a global offering for two billion kids worldwide. Circle Lane is bringing the whole ecosystem together. Teachers, counselors, high schools, nonprofit organizations is how we are reaching Kairas. And of course, we are connecting them to colleges. And we are seeing some amazing initial success. This year, 83,000 students have signed up on Circle Lane, and I'm proud to say 63% belong to low-income group. Four million kids is our target. It's free for students and paid for by universities. $88 million is our revenue target with 90% net profits. And its student is, they are loving the platform. They have reported increased confidence and ease of use. No wonder they are spending 3x more time on our platform versus other platforms. Our team, driven mainly coming from educator families just like me. We can make it happen. Connecting Kyra to colleges cannot be an accident. Our future cannot be an accident. It requires a well laid out plan. Circle in is that plan. Let's change the world together. Thank you. As, as some of you know, it is, it is not easy to get up here and to speak about the things that are passionate and close to your heart. And it's also, there's a blinding light that doesn't help as well, um, but, it's, but it's excellent. As a person who um, has spent 15 years now in education, um, knowing the power of some of the things that we can push forward, incredible job. So we really want to thank um, and move from there. So we've heard our first pitch. We've gotten that one out of the way. And so now we're going we're gonna to move forward through the rest of the evening. So you kind of get the flow now. Um, we have two for-profit organizations that we'll be presenting. So we've just seen circled in. We're prepping for the next one. Everybody feeling good so far tonight? Yeah. All right. All right. Nobody had to battle traffic. Seattle has some of the best traffic in the world. It's so easy to get from point A to point B to point Z. And so it's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, and we love it. And we truly appreciate each and every one of you being here tonight. Um, after this next presentation, we're going to do our first angel checks. And so get yourself ready for that to be able to move forward. So next up, I want to welcome to the stage the wonderful folks at Fuchsia, Inc. Meet Manzoor, a craft artisan in Pakistan. Growing up, he was forced into labor bondage in a brick kiln factory. He was only 11 when his dream to pursue education ended. Today he makes the beautiful shoes that I'm wearing, but cannot earn a living selling them in the local markets. There are 125 million artisans like Mazur across the developing countries making unique one-of-a-kind products, but face one common problem. No access to the global markets. In the local markets, they get exploited by the middleman. <coughs> On the other side, the world consumes 80 billion pieces of new clothing each year. This is fast fashion. Brands mass-producing goods and convincing you to buy clothes you do not need. But do you know that due to its lack of operational sustainability, fast fashion has a huge social and environmental impact? 
Today, on average, American generates 82 pounds of textile waste every year, majority of which ends up in the landfills. Not only this, but many factory workers for fast fashion brands are not paid a living wage and work in dangerous conditions. And that's where we come in. My name is Afsha, and I'm the co-founder of Fuchsia, a direct-to-consumer brand that empowers the artisans by giving them access to the global markets and connects them with consumers who want to buy sustainably made fashion while providing a transparent shopping experience for your purchases. Fashion retail is a growing market. Americans spend $200 billion annually. Our customers are conscious consumers, and we know that out of 92 million millennials in US, 71% wants to shop from social impact brands. There are two main handmade platforms that exist in the market today, designed on a marketplace model. They have product quality or standardization or artisan credibility issues. Furthermore, there's a huge segment of artisans that are untapped by these platforms. Fuchsia solves this problem by bringing artisans under one brand. Our artisans only focus on making stellar products while we determine end-to-end -end product launch strategy from forecasting trends, running marketing campaigns, shipping orders, or even providing customer service. Through our website, you can see the details of the product journey of your Fuchsia products, all the way from sourcing raw material to finished goods. This is a disruptive shopping experience. Extraordinary craftsmanship combined with radical transparency. So far, we have sold over 4,000 artisanal products to date, generating a revenue of 400K, along with 3 million video views of our craftsmanship video on social media, supporting 25 artisans with full-time jobs. All of this without any outside investment. Before Fuchsia, our artisans may have earned up to $50 a month just on their artisan work while working other jobs to make their ends meet. With Fuchsia, they are now making anywhere from $170 to $300 a month along with medical allowances. This is at least two times higher than the minimum wage for workers in this community. So remember Manzoor? He now has the financial stability to end a generational cycle of poverty. He can send his kids to school, enabling them to lead a more prosperous life. My co-founder, Ramiz, and I bring over a decade of experience working for some of the leading tech companies in the world. Our fuchsia journey began three years ago when we were at a farmer's market in Pakistan and came across beautiful handmade products. We learned about the issues the artisans struggle with in the local markets, and we decided to change that. In 2019, we are targeting to onboard up to 1,000 artisans Generating a, creating a value for $2.4 million just in Pakistan. By 2020, we replicate our model to other countries and onboard 10,000 more artisans, creating a value of $24 million cumulative across the globe. So tonight, we ask you to come and join us on our journey to eliminate the cycle of poverty and reduce planetary stress. Together, we can raise the standard of living for hundreds of millions of artisans while adding beautiful, timeless products to your wardrobe. Thank you. Thank you, Fuchsia Inc. Uh, what we have to love is the diversity of just choice and options of, of what we have here tonight. Um, I was learning so much in the back um, just about this organization and, and, and about Circle as well. So here we have tonight, so I wanna, I'm gonna let you into a little of my world. I'm a big, I'm a dreamer. So two of the dreams I've always had is one, I wanted to host the Oscars, and two, I wanted to be, I wanted to be the male Oprah. Now with the first one tonight, you guys are giving me opportunity for my dream. This is like my personal Oscars. Hopefully they don't play wrap up music on me. But then second, we get the opportunity um, tonight for you to join in my, my wish of being the male Oprah as we get to give away some of the angel checks. So right now we're going to get away our first batch of angel checks. So it's kind of like the Oprah thing where you get a car, you get a car, you get a check, you get a check. Um, so I want you to have that same level of excitement like Tom Cruise on the couch, over the top, like just Scientology, just go for it. Um, and so 
We're going to announce our first batch of Angel Award checks. So these are $250 checks that, that you will be able to give to any of the 21 organizations of your choosing tonight. Because remember, we are all, um, we're all innovators and we're all investors here tonight. So I'm gonna, we're going to do this in a couple of different rounds. Again, this is for any of the 21 organizations you see tonight. You have the opportunity. Um, our volunteers, once we call your name, they'll find you. They'll give you a check, and then tonight at the reception, you'll be able to give away your, your angel check to any of the organizations that you deem worthy. Um, so our first name, and I apologize ahead of time. I personally have a pet peeve about um, butchering names, so if I mispronounce your name, I am sorry. Um, if, you have, if you have compliments, my name is Marcus Harden. If you have complaints, it's Solon McCurdy. He's the uh, he's ED of SVP. All complaints go to him. All right, so here we go. Here are our four names. We have Miss Luisa Pertucci. All right, raise your hand big and high, and we'll have our volunteers get to you. Miss Lisa Hanna. Where's Lisa? Lisa's right here. We have one right here. Mr. Er, Winston Kelly. and Brittany Gilbertson. <laughs> Brittany, I thank you because like our volunteers are working hard, but I was like, please somebody be all the way up top. Uh, it'd be great, it feels like it's not like a plant or something, like you just don't have somebody, everybody up in the front. So we appreciate that. So we have a couple more rounds of angel checks tonight, so be ready, and, and, and once again, I wanna thank our volunteers, as much as I'm teasing right now. Um, I don't wanna run up those steps and give you a check, Brittany, I, but I mean, I would love to, but I'd be like, hey, come on down, um, type of deal. So, there you go. So that's our first round of um, angel, angel checks. So what we wanna get to next is our startup nonprofits. All right, we're gonna hear pitches from organizations who are startup nonprofits. They are building ideas that are serving our region, and they have been in operation under three years and have a budget of under $250,000. So this is our startup nonprofit pitch. I want us to give that, keep our same energy. There's gonna be uh, sundries and, and good things later at the reception, so we'll keep you well fed later. But for right now, we need your energies for these pitches. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome for our startup nonprofit, our first organization, Dignity for Divas. In 2007, I became homeless after leaving a 10-year abusive marriage. My name is Nikki Gain, and I'm the founder of Dignity for Divas. Now, tonight I'm gonna to take you on a journey out of homelessness, my journey, and the journey so many people are facing right now today. Now, that picture right there is me. That's my first night in an emergency shelter. And it was the first of many nights of sleeping on floors, couches, in my car, working endless jobs to have the one thing that we all want at the end of the day, and that's to be home. But see, home for me was bittersweet because although I was home and I was safe, I was paralyzed with fear because I didn't know how was I gonna do this? How was I gonna keep this roof over my head? Was I gonna have to go back to my abuser? See, let me tell you how the system is set up for somebody experiencing homelessness. Most you see end up on the streets with little to no resources. If you're lucky, you can get into an emergency shelter or a transitional facility where you can get some support. But the problem starts once you get home. Yes, because once you're home, you're on your own, left to figure it out. Most become so overwhelmed, they give up altogether and go back to the shelter. See, my experience led me to understand what it takes to win your life back and what you have to do in order to regain everything that you lost. Now, Dignity for Divas stays with our ladies from the street to their lease to their dreams. We have four primary programs working with women, helping them to understand why they became homeless in the first place. 
Last year, we served over 15,000 women. Now, the program I want to tell you tonight is our Welcome Home program. And let me tell you, this program is so unique because not only are we providing furniture, brand new housing supplies, and resources, but life-enhancing workshops with key partners teaching these ladies life skills, job training, computer training, financial literacy. Who doesn't need that? Now, right now, today, there are over 12,000 people experiencing homelessness in King County alone. And of that number, 34% are women, 20% women of color who will have additional barriers that most will never get over. Now, our divas come from all different walks of life, all different backgrounds, ethnicities, social status, but they have one thing in common. They all want to win. Women like Gabrielle. Gabrielle came to us after moving into her own place, after sleeping in her car, eight months pregnant. She felt the same way I did. Now, you fast forward to today. Gabrielle works with us at our office, is in college, and is still in her place. Now, that sounds like winning to me. Our women are winning, yes. They're winning because we're working with them and we're staying with them on their journey. Now, we're able to do this with a team of people just like you. You see what's going on in the community. You want to change it. We have a board of directors who believe in what we're doing, and they have the skill set to help us build this organization and grow on purpose. Now, last year, <laughs> we raised $32,000. Now, remember, we helped over 15,000 people with that little bit of change. Yes. Now, can you imagine what we could do with your help? Now, we need $130,000. And this is because we have big plans. Man, in the next few years, we want to hire full-time staff. We need them. Increase our volunteer base and add two additional cities right here that are also experiencing a homeless crisis. Now, I could sit here and talk to you all night. But you guys see it every day when you go home. You see the tents. You see the people that need help. And if we don't change the way that we are helping people, if we don't teach people how to help themselves, then it's not going to change. Now, I'm asking you, join us on the real change to end homelessness. Help a woman win in this game called life. Because we all want to win, don't we? Yes. My name is Nikki Gain, and I'm a diva. She made that hard to follow. I want to be a I want to be a diva too. Uh, <laughs> no, we 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 love it. Um, powerful, powerful stories. Again, um, it gives us a great. Um, barometer of like just the incredible work that's happening in our region and, and just again know that there's um, we have a lot, we have some of our semifinalists who you'll meet here later there are so many powerful and incredible organizations doing work in this region um, and I know if you're here that many of you are part of those your boards your volunteer on but your your volunteers your people who maybe have startup organizations yourself who want to who want to push these things and so um, it's just really overwhelming actually to see the the power that we can have as a community. And again, you're here on a Saturday night. You could, you could be any place else. You could be doing karaoke, one of my favorite pastimes. You could be, um, you could be watching, uh, is the Wazoo game still on? Um, I, it's a junior college over on the other side of the mountains. Um, and so you could, be, you could be doing anything right now, but you're here with us. And so we appreciate it. Um, next up, we want to hear from another fantastic organization. And that organization goes by the name of Elixir. Healthcare is a fundamental human right. Hi, 
my name is Miriam Raza, and I'm a sophomore right here at the University of Washington. I came to this conviction as a child, observing people without medical care in my parents' homeland of Pakistan. I grew up understanding I was privileged to live in Seattle, where I thought anyone could go to the doctors whenever they needed. It didn't even cross my mind that people would face the same barriers to medical care right here in my own backyard, until I met Maria. Maria is one of the first friends I made when I started college. And even though we're both 19, we're both from Seattle, there is a crucial difference in our lives. Unlike me, Maria's uninsured. As the child of undocumented immigrants, she can't buy a healthcare policy, meaning an overnight hospital stay could end up costing her more than three months' rent. And Maria is only one of 250,000 undocumented immigrants in our state. Aside from that, 500,000 more citizens in our state are uninsured. Of all these, 70% are people of color. For these individuals, their only option is to visit a community health center or a free clinic. And there are over 500 of these clinics in our state with the potential capacity to care for thousands. But with little actual information about them in uninsured communities, many clinics remain empty while a few others are overloaded. And the same was true when I talked to Maria. The only clinics she actually knew about were too far away from her dorm to go to. And she also felt unsure trusting a clinic she hadn't been to before due to her undocumented status. So Maria told me that when she gets sick, she usually just waits it out and hopes somehow she'll feel better. Appalled at this situation, I founded Elixir. Elixir's mission is to connect uninsured and undocumented individuals with healthcare in their communities. We want to link the 500 clinics with the 750,000 who need care. Elixir's volunteers run monthly workshops at local community centers to build trust and to inform individuals about their rights and strategies to access culturally competent health care. We then point individuals towards our app. Uninsured individuals can anonymously use the Elixir app to search by symptom for the most convenient clinic location with the shortest wait time. They can read and leave their own comments for the clinics where they get care, building online community. And if they need more help, Elixir is still there for them. We personally connect uninsured individuals with someone in our organization to help them navigate the complex healthcare system. So how do we make this all happen? Well, our committed core team is a group of UW students, Falak Dowd, Elena Spasova, and Sofia Viotto. We also have an experienced board of healthcare professionals and social workers who advise us on everything from healthcare law to privacy issues. In just four months, we've already developed and conducted our first workshops. We've won a grant from Comotion Labs, and we're beta testing our app in racially diverse groups. And all this is powered by our dedicated 25 student volunteers who help us with outreach. And our student volunteer model is renewable because even as Elixir's volunteers graduate, every year we recruit new ones who take their place. Financially, we're making this possible through our university level fundraising and our clinic partnership program. And as we continue to grow, we need your help. We need funding to scale our operations. With every $10,000 we get, we'll be in five more community centers, in three more languages, impacting the lives of 2,000 more people in the Seattle area. And that's just the start. More funding will increase our impact exponentially until ultimately, I envision a state where every uninsured and undocumented individual has the same tools to access healthcare as I've had all my life. And that includes people like my friend Maria. Now when she gets sick, she doesn't have to just wait it out, hoping somehow she'll get better. 
Instead, with Elixir's help, she'll be able to access healthcare when she needs it, just like me. With your support, let's do the same for the 750,000 like Maria, connecting communities with care, truly making healthcare a human right. Thank you. It just gets, it gets tougher and tougher each one. I'm like, oh, I love that one. I love that one. It's like going uh, Christmas shopping or holiday shopping, and you're like, oh, I love that pair of socks. No, I love this one um, after each one. So it's incredible. Um, let's give Elixir another round of applause. And so I hope you're thinking about if, if you become a lucky winner of an angel check, some of the organizations that maybe you want to move towards and push, um, push for a little later to maybe um, give some of your investment. And again, if you see an organization that you really want to be involved in in general, um, there's information in your programs. These are some wonderful, wonderful causes. Um, I'm sitting back and I'm like, man, that's a great idea. Somebody, I'm glad somebody's thought of that, and I'm glad that's out there in the world um, for us to have. And so we want to get ready for our next pitch. So coming next to the stage, we will have our wonderful people from Rainier Valley Midwives. My dear friends, aloha. 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 Thank you. In Hawaii, aloha means hello, goodbye, love. But my favorite meaning is sharing the ha, the breath of life. My greatest calling is welcoming the breath of life as a midwife. My name is Tyra Wall, and I'm the co-founder of the Rainier Valley Midwives. The philosophy of midwifery is centered in the naturalness of birth. Midwives care and support for their families, guiding them through that birthing process. My grandma in Hawaii had 13 children, all born at home. My grandma from India had eight children, all born at home. I thought I would follow in their footsteps. However, like many children of immigrants, I grew up in poverty and at higher risk for birth complications. And I ended up having a C-section, and my baby was admitted to the neonatal intensive care unit. But I was the lucky one, because my son lived. The sad truth is black and, black and Native American babies are two and a half times more likely to die by their first birthday than other babies. And our black mamas are up to four times more likely to die due to birth complications and pregnancy complications. My story is so common in South King County, our community of rich diversity. Nearly a third of our families live in poverty, and many struggle to even make it to the doctor when they're pregnant. Compared to the average King County mom, our Pacific Islander moms are more likely to have their babies early. And babies who are born early are more likely to develop, um, develop mental delays and chronic health issues. It's a multi-generational impact. Our families are suffering, and it devastates the whole community. We can do better. We must do better. So what can we do? In a typical pregnancy, a mother will go to a doctor for all their care, and if they wanted any other services, well, that costs extra. So we've developed a better way. Midwifery-led collaborative care. And it starts with our moms. And we have midwives who are natural supporters of, of our pregnant women, and they will lead the collaborative care teams. We partner with doctors to offer more birthing options. We provide birth doulas so that they help moms during labor support. We have lactation specialists that will help moms who choose to breastfeed. And then after the birth, that's when we have our postpartum doulas who will go to, to their homes and help mom with the baby. Usually, these kinds of services cost families thousands of dollars. But we've decided to change the system and keep moms at the center of care. We call this our birth bundle, a comprehensive collaborative care approach that's rooted in the community at no extra cost to our families. It's amazing. The Rainier Valley Midwives is a startup nonprofit organization, and in our first two years, we served 41 families. 
<laughs> actually, our very first baby was born the morning of our open house. <laughs> and I caught her. <laughs> Our clinic is located in the heart of the Rainier Valley in an old, beat-up Speedy Mart. <laughs> but with the help of 100 volunteers, we were able to convert it into an awesome clinic. However, after a year, our rent nearly tripled from $1,400 to $4,000, and we were forced out of our, our, out of our valley. But despite all of our challenges, we bounced back. Our team is amazing. We have two midwives of color and lactation specialists and doulas from within the community that we serve. Our board and our community partners provide so much expertise and valuable resources to our families. Look, health insurance, they pay for our basic medical care. And recently, we were just awarded a two-year innovation grant from um, King County that will help build our infrastructure. We project that within two years, we'll have enough granting partners and insured clients to sustain this model. We know this collaborative care model works. And with your help, we can make this happen. With $200,000 over the next two years, we'll be able to provide birth bundles to 75 more families and open clinics within the communities that they live. And lastly, we will identify, recruit, and support more providers of color so that they too can welcome the breath of life. I'm Tarla Wall, I'm the co-founder of the Rainier Valley Midwives, and together with your cell phones, we can make this happen. <laughs> Aloha. Someone left their sandals, but we'll get those later. Oh, <laughs> I thought it was a gift. I was like, yes, this is what happens when you host the Oscars. Um, it was wonderful. I'm glad, I'm glad we got to hear from that. And I, as a proud resident um, of the, uh, the South End, I was glad to see Speedy Mart. I used to actually ride my bike down the street to that place and, um, and get, what did they used to buy? Uh, whatever they had there, you know, whatever, whatever the dollar twenty-five that I scraped together was able to get. But it was awesome. So I hope so far tonight, as we've gotten through some of our nonprofit and our for-profit, that you've, you've felt something and heard something that's kind of spoken to you um, and touched your heart. And again, there's no end to giving. If you want to give to every organization, feel free to do that. But tonight, um, the judges have a hard job, but all of us um, have an easy job. We so want to give. So next up, I want to welcome um, our last uh, nonprofit organization to the stage, and that would be the Refugee Artisan Initiative. My name is Ming Ming Tang Edelman. I'm an immigrant from Taiwan, mother of two, and founder of Refugee Artisan Initiative. We empower refugee and immigrant women to be self-sufficient, one sole mission at a time. I'd like to introduce you to Rahel. She is a refugee from Ethiopia. She came to Seattle seven years ago. Rahel needed to work, but with little education, language barrier, and not able to afford childcare. She could not work. But Rahel can sell. She wanted to open a home sewing shop to support her family. But with no money to buy equipment and no proper training, how could that be possible? This is Rahel today. It is possible. How did she get here? Because of Refugee Artists Initiative. There are 2,500 refugees coming to Washington State each year. They're eager to work, ready to contribute to their new homeland. Refugee women, Minister of Red Health, need home-based work. I'm inspired to help these women because my strong, scrappy grandmother, Shi Tzu, she was a single mother able to raise three children with a sewing machine and skills as a seamstress. While studying fa fashion a few years ago, I met another group of strong, scrappy refugee women. They can sew and need home-based work. At the same time, I was disgusted by the tremendous amount of fashion waste, fabric waste, all go to the landfill. There was this aha moment when I married the two and create jobs to meet their needs. We have a home-based program. We'll provide our artisans 
with equipment, sewing machine, and material we bring to their home. And we provide them with extensive training so they can begin make our products being paid at least $15 to $25 an hour. And we bring their finished product to a vast market. We turn scraps into inspirational designs. 90% of what we make is from recycled material. This necklace I'm wearing is a great example. Upcycle from Oprah Winfrey's gently used jumpsuit. <laughs> you can find our eco-friendly products at stores, online, and events. We are the only organization in Puget Sound providing registered women with free tools and training, make our design, do small sewing production runs, and embrace upcycling so, so we can be good to our planet. We are only two years old, but we have a committed talent team with years of experience in human resource, finance, sales, marketing, ma and manufacturing. We even have a refugee on board, Celine Vaughn. She is our marketing guru. The board has a new vision. Starting this June, we begin to offer small sewing production runs. This allows designers to work with our artisans and get many benefits. They only have to make a few hundred pieces instead of thousands many manufacturers would require to take on their jobs. So they can save money and avoid waste. And this also gives them the freedom to create other new designs. More importantly, they promote ethical manufacturing by giving our artisans fair wages. So this is a niche market where we have seven partners and four ready to sign on. We have an emerging market growing at least one partner per week. This means we'll have 150 partners in three years. Currently, we have six artisans and with a wait list of scrappy, strong refugee women eager to join. At the current growth rate, we need to add at least one artisan per month. That will be 50 artisans in three years. Currently, 40% of revenue is from sales and small batch manufacturing. We'll come to them and go up to 90% in three years. As you can see, there's a strong demand for our service. And there is a supply of artisans eager to work. What's missing are equipment and infrastructure. So I'm standing here today sincerely asking you for $250,000. $450,000, you can help provide better training and equipment to onboard 50 artisans. And the other $100,000 you help us providing staff and operations. After seven long years, Rahel had finally made her first paycheck in America. Now with steady work coming to her, she's able to make at least $600 per month to help supporting her family. More importantly, at the other five artisans, we give them the tools and skills to be self-sufficient so they can provide for their family as well. And another thing most important is that we give them the dignity and self-esteem they deserve. So join our movement, helping strong, scrappy, rugged women stitching new lives, one soul mission at a time. Thank you. Pull out your cell phones and do that. I always have, I have such great respect for people who have talent that I don't have, which is a lot of people. Um, and so when I think about just, I was sitting back there and I was like, what happened if I would have a sewing machine? And I would be here for years just putting the thimble on, let alone um, pushing from there. So I, I, I appreciate it and I appreciate the passion in, in which each and every one of our presenters um, have come with tonight. So. Now I get the opportunity to come back to be your Seattle version of Oprah because it's angel check time. Oh, you got to be more excited than that. It's angel check time. There you go.
Remember, this is just your opportunity to give. There's nothing greater uh, than the opportunity to give. I mean, it would be great if, I'm sure if I was saying I was giving you the $250, the applause would go up exponentially. But for right now, I want us to pretend and have that feeling. So first up, what we have next um, for our angel checks is we're going we're gonna to give these wonderful people um, there, so make sure you put your hand up so our volunteers can get to you. My hope is by the end of the night, somebody's at the very tippy top, so somebody's uh, eye watch can get their great steps. So first, we have Mr. David Farrell. David's right over here, one of our wonderful volunteers. Yeah, oh, this one's gonna just, you're just doing me in here with this one. All right, here we go, we're gonna try it. James Toa, did I say it right? Twa, Twa, Twa. <laughs> Demi Lagayas. Did I say that right? Did I really? Oh, yeah. Awesome. All right. And then Hannah Johnson. I got that one, I think. All right. Awesome. So hold on to those checks. We will see you at the reception tonight. Don't spill any red wine on them, only white. But make sure that you give it away to an organization that has spoken to you tonight, any of the 21 that you see up here. And so now we get the opportunity to move forward to our established nonprofit uh, category. So our final category of organizations is the evening. Um, these organizations are larger, more established than the last cohort, but they are all launching a new program or venture that is less than three years old. And so what I would like to do, um, our first organization, um, their, their person tonight was actually um, held up, not held up, held up is the wrong word. They, are, <laughs> they had travel issues in Detroit, although I guess you could be held up in Detroit. Either way, it doesn't matter. But they had, they had travel issues in Detroit, so they were unable to make it. And so um, in their stead um, will be um, a proud father and somebody who's going to be able to speak to the power of what the organization has. And as a personal side, um, and, and not to pitch anything, but as a, as, a, as a foster parent and a foster adoptive parent, it's such a truly powerful thing to be able to have this testimony. So we want to be able to um, welcome Mr. Rockney to the stage, and he's going to share a little bit about Amara. Thank you, Marcus. I'm not here to give you a fast pitch. Uh, my name is Rockney Ignatius, and I'm here to represent the Amara Star Program uh, from the heart uh, as a father who has uh, a young son participating in the program. Let's unpack uh, the program real quick. Amara is a nonprofit adoptive agency. Uh, they have, for the last two years, been sponsoring a pilot program that's geared towards post-adoption adoptee mentorship. Two questions. Who am, I, who am I? How did I get here? These are questions we all ask ourselves from when we were really small. People were asking that of us, and we asked that of ourselves. If you ask a very little one that question, they might get embarrassed. And invariably, they do this. Or they go run under someone's legs. Who is that? That's their parents. It's a simple answer. For my son and thousands of people, tens of thousands of kids being raised as adoptees, that's not an easy answer. It's a complex question and answer it's emotionally charged always, and oftentimes it's very painful. But that's where Amara Starr's mentorship comes in. Angela Tucker, who couldn't be with us tonight because of a, 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 an air, airline um, problem, um, should hopefully be, be able to join us at the booth a little bit later. And her team, they get kids who are growing up adopted together, first and foremost, so they can talk about it. And they match them up and connect them with adults who have already grown up adopted. I don't know of any other place where this is happening. But it's organic. It doesn't have to be about adoption right away. They allow the kids to select 
their own time and place and select their own confidants, often multiple adults. It's a program that's by adoptees, for adoptees, and of adoptees. And I'm so proud to be here today to represent that. Uh, Angela's not gonna be up for the, the, Angela and her organization's not gonna be up for the top prize uh, because I guess, you know, she, someone has to be here from the organization. She has to be here from the organization. But we are gonna have a booth a little bit later on and would like to invite you to um, find out more about the program and find out where we're taking the program. Just in the last year, um, my son Evan has had a transformative experience with a person that he selected and who he sees once a month individually and is still going to those big group meetings uh, and potentially selecting another person this next year. So he's going to stay in touch with these folks. It's a lifelong opportunity. And he's talked about one day, I mean, I'm so excited about not being a part of the program even 10 years from now, when he has a chance to be a mentor and pass forward what he's learned. There's nothing more powerful than hearing from the mentors themselves what a huge opportunity this was and how they wish they had something like this. So uh, please join me uh, at the booth with uh, Angela and her team and find out some of the things we're doing to both scale this program, take it out of its pilot status, scale it and replicate it uh, first in Pierce County in 2019 and then hopefully nationwide because there's a giant appetite for it. Thank you very much. So make sure you're able to, to join later and join us at the reception. Um, it's going to be fun. I mean, I'm, we're excited. And hopefully, I apologize if anybody here is from Detroit. I didn't want to disparage your town. Um, and so uh, we're so sad that Angela couldn't join us tonight. But um, Amara continues to do great work. And again, if you want to learn more um, at the reception, that's a great pay place to mix, mingle, pass out angel checks. If you have your own checkbook, if people just carry around checkbooks on Saturday night, uh, write it. Um, that's M-A-R-C-U-S. Um, and you can put as many zeros on there as you want, uh, rent's past due. And so um, we really appreciate it moving forward. And so next we want to continue along um, and get back to our pitches um, for our established nonprofits. So I wanted you to help me welcome to the stage the Food Innovation Network. Imagine moving to a country where you don't speak the common language, you're starting over, and business opportunities are limiting, but you have skills and you have experience. You ran a family business. This is what happened to Caroline when she moved to the US from Congo several years ago with her family. Caroline has incredible culinary skills. She learned to cook at age 10 from her mom and assisted her in her catering business. She then went on to run this family business before moving to the US. This past spring, Caroline launched Taste of Congo, the first and only Congolese food business here in the region. She's now generating income for her family and has created quite a bit of excitement among her community. Hi, I'm Kara Martin, the director of the Food Innovation Network. As a program of Global to Local, we work with Caroline and others to get on a path to living a healthy and financially stable life. Our programming spans across the community food system, but the area of work that I want to share with you is our business incubator program. Our team has deep experience in food system work. Our staff and partners have backgrounds in business development training, and some of us have had our own businesses. We also work with community advocates who are out in the community doing outreach and connecting people to our programs and resources. This is how we met Caroline and learned she is just one of many aspiring food entrepreneurs in South King County. So we conducted a feasibility study to get a better sense of the demands and needs for an incubation program. We learned that nearly 200 people in the area want to start a food business, and the demand is particularly high among women and immigrants and refugees. And half of these people are coming from families with household incomes under $25,000. 
but like Caroline, two thirds of them already have food industry skills. And there's real potential in our local food sector. King County has seen considerable growth in the number of food businesses, jobs, and sales. And consumer research shows that there's a real desire for international foods and new flavors and products. But Caroline and others face significant barriers to market entry. The top barriers they identified include access to finance and capital, access to commercial kitchen space, and navigating permitting and licensing. This is where the incubation program comes in, through the subsidized rent provided at a shared commercial kitchen facility along with the business support. So with our partners, we set out to test these services while planning for our dream space. In 2017, we launched a pilot program through leasing a small commercial kitchen. Through our customized coaching and a peer network, we support the businesses every step of the way. So for example, with Caroline, we helped her obtain a public health permit, something completely new to her, and got her into two farmer's markets where she saw a steady growth in sales. Our pilot has now helped launch nine businesses, and now we have an exciting opportunity to build off this success and help launch more. Late next year, we will be opening our dream space, a food hall six times the size of our current location. We've been, it will be located in Tequila Village, a new mixed-use development, where we've been working with the developer on a long-term lease arrangement. This new space could accommodate up to 20 businesses, including eight that would rent stalls in the food hall. Others would use the space for off-site sales, such as catering and farmer's markets. The subsidized rent will help these businesses launch and scale so they can move into their own space one day. Meanwhile, that rent generated would cover over half of our operating expenses. Our goal in the next five years is to help launch 30 businesses and create over 40 jobs. So, Perhaps you might come and try Lillian's jollof rice, a Nigerian staple, or Benson's Kenyan-style sambusa, or Sister Zozan and Shalon's kanafa, a Kurdish dessert favorite. This will be a third space, a space where the community will gather, learn about, and celebrate rich food traditions while creating community wealth. And this is what sets us apart from other incubator programs. We're creating a community asset that all members of the community can be a part of and support. To build out this space, we need to raise $800,000 in funds. 60% would go towards construction, 30% towards the equipment, and the remainder towards the initial operating expenses. We're working with a couple of state legislators who will sponsor a request in next year's state budget that would cover over half of the build-out expenses. For the remainder, we're turning to local funders and the community, you. Please help us make this happen. Here's how. Support today's entrepreneurs by placing your next catering order with them. The holidays are here. Support tomorrow's by contributing to our capital campaign and letting your local state elected know to support this project. Join the Food Innovation Network in building this vibrant community space and have a seat at the table. Awesome. I, I have to uh, have a little bit of a confession. I am a Food Network uh, junkie. So um, between Food Network and Golden Girls, that's usually my end of the night routine. Um, my, my brain, like it's always on, so I have to watch things that like don't have me think. So I got really excited when I first saw, I was like, the Food Network's here. And I was like, oh wait, that's even better. It's, it's even something, something more local. So I got excited because I thought like maybe Bobby Flay would pop out um, and something would be cool. And so that's, that's just, I'm giving you guys a little insight into me. Um, it's usually Golden Girls Chopped and um, what else do I usually like to watch? In cartoons that I've seen a thousand times, like you're like, man, that guy's really a genius. No, it's really low key at the end of the night. Um, and so um, it's just Betty White and, and some, some meals. Um, and so with that, I want to bring to the stage our next organization that will be presented for our established nonprofit, and that'll be Rebuilding Together Seattle. When I met Ruth in 2014, she had four inches of standing water in her basement, a kitchen with only a microwave, and a heart so heavy from the loss of her husband and son that she was burying herself in their belongings. Ruth had lived in her home for 30 years, but it wasn't clear how much longer she would be able to stay there. My name is Caleb Marshall, and I'm the executive director of Rebuilding Together Seattle. Rebuilding Together is confronting our region's housing crisis by addressing unsafe, and unhealthy housing conditions. 
We know from census data that there are over 76,000 of our neighbors living below the federal poverty line in homes that they own but are struggling to keep and maintain. Moreover, housing instability and displacement are dis disproportionately affecting communities of color. African American home ownership in Seattle, for example, has fallen by half since 2000. And neighborhoods with poverty above 20% have more than doubled. So what can we do to ensure that homes are not only affordable, but aren't putting families at risk of injury or illness? Well, for 29 years, Rebuilding Together has mobilized volunteers and leveraged resources to perform home repairs, accessibility modifications, and housing rehab for low-income homeowners at entirely no cost to them. We can take non-functioning kitchens like this and turn them into this. Hazardous entryways like this and make them safe again. And we can even strip down the side of your home to remove three colonies of invading bees if we have to. And make sure the bees are also safely rehoused. <laughs> Everybody loves the bees until they're in your home. <laughs> but what about Ruth? Well, with a little bit of funding, a lot of volunteer support, and a reassuring hug to let her know that she wasn't alone, we were able to clear the basement and divert the rainwater, rebuild her kitchen, and help Ruth reclaim her life and her independence. I think Ruth said it best, though. Rebuilding together caught me while I was drowning. Someone reached into the water and pulled me out to give me the boost that I needed. Because of you, I'm now breathing again. Last year, we touched lives in 223 households like Ruth's. But what if we could transform not only the lives of individuals, but start to improve the health and vibrancy of entire neighborhoods? What if, for example, we partnered with schools to build community gardens? the transportation department to paint intersections, small businesses to remodel their stores, or other nonprofits to increase access to healthcare together. How would Ruth's and her neighbors' lives be different then? We believe that by intentionally concentrating and connecting more of our projects and communities of opportunity, we can achieve three key things. First, contribute to other types of projects addressing community health wherever they intersect with housing. Second, better preserve the character and culture of our neighborhoods while closing the wealth gap in communities of color. And third, increase organizational capacity and efficiency, allowing us to reach more people faster and investing more per home. We're testing this approach with a five-year pilot initiative in the Sunset neighborhood of Renton, and we invite the SPV community to join us. Sunset was originally developed during World War II as temporary housing for Boeing and Packard workers. Today, Sunset is still a working class community, but with poverty above 27%, this multicultural neighborhood is being left behind in our region's economic boom. Our piece of the transformation plan will raise half a million dollars. 400,000 to rehab 20 homes, most of them duplexes, including a demonstration project with the county and city that we've already begun. We'll also work with residents and organizations to invest $100,000 in community-driven projects that can revitalize the neighborhood. With a strong corporate sponsorship model, we have a solid fundraising base from which to expand as we seek additional revenue streams to support this initiative. And while we're a small staff of five, we're a large family of over 2,000 volunteers and supporters, some of whom have been with us for more than 25 years. Our staff are trained to work alongside communities, and we're backed by a board that has expertise in construction, housing, healthcare, business and economic development, amongst other fields. Our team is ready to go at Sunset. We have an affiliate network of 130, 130 affiliates across the country ready to support us, including a national office that's worked with some of them to launch community-centric models of their own. But we need everyone to get involved. We need businesses and organizations, artists and designers, gardeners and arborists, educators and organizers, philanthropists and investors. In short, we need rebuilders, because together we can repair homes, revitalize communities, and rebuild lives. Thank you. After every one, I just want to pick up a new skill or hobby. I'm like, I'll build with you. Um, I'm, not, I'm not really good with my hands either. It took me like two years to put together an Ikea dresser. Um, 
but I'll hold something for them. Um, and if you have the talent of building or doing something from there, then please, um, please. Again, so many just powerful organizations. I'm just, I'm, um, I, I joke, and that's how I, how I process the world, but I truly am moved um, by just all the powerful things that we're able to do here today um, moving forward. So again, you have the opportunity to put your um, push behind some of these organizations, so make sure you're using your free text messaging, whether it be T-Mobile, AT&T, uh, Boost Mobile, if you have it, no judgment. Um, whatever, whatever, is, whatever you're able to communicate with in the world, if you can get Wi-Fi in here, it's always tough, but use your Wi-Fi however you need to push your support for any of the organizations. So next up for our established nonprofit organization, please um, join me in welcoming to the stage Seattle Against Slavery. About 10 years ago, I was volunteering in Southeast Asia, and a healthcare worker asked me if I wanted to meet the girls that they helped in a local brothel. I was unprepared for that experience. It was pretty shocking, because when I say girls, I mean 13, 14, 15-year-old girls. And there was this one girl, a 15-year-old Muslim girl, who had been sold for sex since she was 13 in India and Burma and Thailand. And she basically changed the course of my life when she asked me a question. She said, are there places like this where you come from? And I knew right here in Seattle that there were kids just as young as her, 13, 14, 15 years old, who were being sold for sex. And I had never done anything about it. And so it was heartbreaking to me, but I knew that when I came back, I wanted to help make a change. I'm Robert Beiser, and I'm executive director of an organization called Seattle Against Slavery. And we envision a community where no one is exploited for labor or sex. When I came back to the States, what I learned was that not only was sex trafficking here a horrible and violent crime, that it also was along clear racial lines of bias. In a county that is 7% African American, among the sex trafficking victims who are children in our community, 52% of them are African American. And it's not just the victims where racial disparity shows up. Of a 68% white county, the men who are arrested for buying sex with kids are 80% white. It's outrageous. and. I wanted to do something about it, and the people in my community wanted to do something about it, so we brought together a team of leaders, starting with survivors from communities of color, and then connecting with service providers, like Real Escape from the Sex Trade, Organization for Prostitution Survivors, and bringing in the tech experts, people like Microsoft and Tableau and Twilio, with advisors all the way up to Microsoft President Brad Smith. And we decided on two pretty clear goals reaching the trafficking victims to help them escape, and deterring the buyers who were exploiting. And together, what we built was a tool called Freedom Signal. How Freedom Signal works is that most sex trafficking in our area is happening online. That traffickers have victims post themselves in online ads, and then buyers search the internet, find these ads, and send text messages to the victims. The first part of Freedom Signal was reaching those victims before the buyers could exploit them again and again, a thing that we call live text outreach. This allows service providers to send a text message directly to those victims online and give them an opportunity to escape. Now, the service providers told us, don't get your hopes up too high with your new tech solution. We do street outreach. And we have 50 volunteers who go out all throughout the year. And in a given year, we probably get between three and five folks out of the sex trade and into direct services. In our first pilot year of doing live text outreach with just one advocate sending text once a week, we had over 40 survivors who were able to get out of sex trafficking. It was incredible. Thank you. But what we saw was that these buyers were still out there. And so while we were helping victims escape, pimps and traffickers still wanted that money, and so they were finding new victims in communities who were vulnerable. So the second half of Freedom Signal was a deterrence chatbot that poses as a trafficking victim online. 
because these buyers don't know who they're talking to. So when they go and find an ad, they see bot after bot after bot. This is an example of a real buyer conversation between a guy who says his name is Joe and what he thinks is a potential trafficking victim, but is actually a chat bot. Says she's young, he says that's okay, and then she says, I'm just 15 years old, and you hope that Joe just ends the conversation there, but instead he says, yeah, no worries, babe, and sends a kissy emoji. Normally, this would be where Joe exploits someone for sex, but instead, this is where the bot drops the hammer and says, soliciting sex is a crime, you may be contacted by law enforcement, yeah. To date, we've been able to disrupt over 15,000 attempts to buy sex from trafficking victims online, which is incredible. Thank you. But we've just started here in Washington State, and we know that there are children at risk of being trafficked all over the country, and this is where you come in. What we need to expand this program is $250,000 to reach 1,000 trafficking victims, to disrupt 25,000 more buyers, and scale to 10 cities. We envision a community where no one is exploited for labor or sex, and you can help us make that a reality. Thank you. I have nothing for that one, uh, except that it's incredible and awesome work um, that's, that's really pushing and, and moving the needle to support folks who need it. And so are we having a good time so far tonight? We are. We are coming up on our last, uh, our last established nonprofit presentation. I do not envy the judges, but that is why we pay them the big bucks, um, is to come here for free and judge, my favorite four-letter word, which is free. Um, and so they have a tough task ahead of them, and we all do as far as supporting these wonderful organizations. Again, it's just so powerful to be in a region where people really care, um, and there's such a, such a plethora of things to care about. Um, and so it's awesome. So next, I would like to welcome to the stage our last established nonprofit group, which will be Tech Bridge Girls. Good evening. My name is Chanel Hall, and I'm a program manager for Tech Bridge Girls. Tonight, I want you to walk away excited and ready to be champions for Girls in STEM. Raise your hand if you've seen the movie Hidden Figures. Wasn't it amazing? As a woman with a science background, I was in awe of Katherine Johnson's intelligence and perseverance to prove that she was one of the best mathematicians at NASA. As inspiring as her story is, the movie depicts an unfortunate reality that today, in 2018, women, especially women of color, have... Are, have <sighs> are consistently being left out of the science, technology, engineering, and math fields, also known as STEM. Seattle has one of the strongest STEM markets in the country, and yet currently there are 25,000 unfilled jobs. And if those jobs were filled today, only 25% would be held by women and less than 3% by women of color. But the problem isn't that women aren't interested in STEM. The problem is, from a young age, youth from low-income communities, especially girls of color, have less access to STEM education, leaving them unprepared to enter into STEM in college and the workforce. And our communities are facing this problem. Here in Washington, only 34% of fourth graders received one to three hours of science per week in school and only 40% of eighth grade females took an algebra math class or higher. So tonight, I want to talk to you about TechBridge Girls and our solution to this problem. We see a world where all girls thrive in STEM. With a focus on girls of color, we actively work with Title I schools to increase STEM education. And our national goal is to reach 1 million girls by 2030, including 13,000 here in our region. So what do we do? We're unique because we don't just focus on computer science as many of our colleagues do. We excite, educate, and equip girls from fourth to 12th grade through our hands-on after-school programs, building their technical skills and preparing them to pursue STEM. 
And girls like Lyric love TechBridge. Now, Lyric's pretty shy in class, but every Tuesday, she gets to be with other girls, creating things like new bubble designs, sharing her ideas, and building her confidence. When I started this job a few years ago, I was able to work with 80 amazing girls of year, a year, and I loved it because they reminded me of myself at that age and my love for science. But my capacity can only go so far. So last year, we piloted a new business model at the elementary level where we empowered educators to run programs. And instead of 80 girls, I help serve 240 girls. This is innovating because a trainer trainer model for after school is uncommon. Many educators receive a binder of curriculum with little to no support or training from nonprofits. But we provide everything needed to run our programs. Our school standard aligned curriculum and pre kitted materials, a two day training, and one on one coaching. Teachers are so busy, as you know, and have very little time to prep or build their STEM knowledge. But we provide everything needed. And our girls can focus, and our educators can focus on reaching more girls. And our model is sustainable because we have decreased our cost per girl. And the support we receive from our funders allows us to scale and triple our impact. Over the last 18 years, we've served thousands of girls. And our team has years of educational and professional experience. But we need your help. So tonight, I'm asking each and every one of you to become champions for TechBridge Girls. You can do this by sharing about us with your colleagues and neighborhood schools. You can volunteer and you can invest. We are seeking $250,000 to train 25 more educators over the next five years, which would allow us to serve 5,000 more girls. Wouldn't it be amazing if we were able to serve every elementary school in Southeast Seattle? We are building the scientists, innovators, and Katherine Johnsons of the future to fill those 25,000 jobs. Let's do this together. Thank you. Incredible, incredible. We, gotta, we have to fill all those jobs, so why not do it from inside? And uh, 25,000, that's a lot of jobs available. So awesome. Let's give a big round of applause for all of our presenters um, who have gone tonight. So now, what I would like to do is excuse our judges. Um, they'll go to our green room, and it, it is, is it, it's a green room that is as plush as you would think. There's oranges, there's pretzels, uh, there's Costco Kirkland Signature Water, my favorite tap water. Um, so I want to excuse the judges so they'll have um, some time to deliberate. Um, but we're going to keep we're going to keep the program moving a little. Give yourselves a round of applause. Um, that's the MC's cheapest pop they can get. But um, the greatest thing about it is it's true. None of this happens without you. And as I'm looking up, it looks like almost every single seat is filled, which means you spent the time um, to be here and go. So again, we have the options up on the screen. Um, the judges are going to deliberate. So now um, it's time for our final set of angel checks. Who's excited to maybe get an angel check? All right. So here we go with our, with our last three. Oh, I'm lying. Um, our last five, ha, over, what is it, uh, under, under, under promise, over deliver, we're going to give five angel checks um, instead of three. So here we go. Miss Michelle Freed, raise your hand. Michelle up top there. <laughs> Kelly Zuger. <laughs> Kelly's over there for wonderful volunteers. Yash Dalal. Brad Baldwin. And Ashley Mandel. Ashley right there. All right. So we've got some wonderful 
angel checks that we've given out. So tonight, uh, in a few, not too far from now, because we're, we're coming near to the end of the program, uh, you have the opportunity to give some of those wonderful things today. And again, I don't envy you as well, um, because there's so many powerful organizations that we got to see. So every year we gather to hear about the amazing work done in our community. Um, and every year we're able to come here to Fast Fish and SVP, and we see all the amazing work, but you're like, hmm. I wonder what happened to that organization I gave or I, I supported or thought about next year. How many, show of hands again, how many of you are returning fast pitch folks? Man, that's awesome. That's awesome. So this is for you. And if it's your first time, just pretend like you saw this organization maybe a long time ago and you really would have supported them if you were here, but tonight you will. So we have a quick um, a video that's going to talk about organizations that give us updates from organizations um, in 2013, 2014, and 2017. Um, and then we will come right back. So please enjoy this quick video about a little where are they now. My name is Alexa Bednars. I am the founder of Eco Shelter, and we are a social enterprise introducing a safe and affordable roofing solution for low-income populations in India. We received the Audience Choice Award and also several angel checks from people in the audience, which was really the jumpstart for our organization and our first seed funding that's enabled us to get through some of our first milestones. We were able to procure the first small batch of roofing material. Uh, so we built the first demonstration home in Hyderabad this year, and we actually just got an order from our first customer, and we'll be building two additional homes in India this fall. Shelter is one of the most basic human necessities. It starts with the roof over your head, and there are millions of people without that. And if you're exposed to the elements or you have a roof that makes you sick, um, how can you have a productive and healthy life? We're really excited to launch a crowdfunding campaign soon. Uh, I think it'll be another great opportunity to re-engage with this community, and the funding will help get us through the next milestones, which um, will allow us to prove our business model, further test our product with users, and, and make the adaptations that we need to make this truly scalable and reach millions of people. I wanna say thank you for your support last year. Uh, because of you, uh, I think we're on a path to do something very, very big. The Youth Ambassador Program is an in-school curriculum to support social studies teachers to engage students civically with heart and with compassion. How we got involved with SVP Fast Pitch is one of my students, Olivia, she started off as a freshman in my program and then when she became a senior she volunteered and she wanted to get out in the community and make sure that people knew what we were doing and how we wanted to change the world. Many connections came from that and also a grant that really allowed us to take the next step that we needed to in order to grow the program. It was inspirational for Olivia to present at SVP Fast Pitch because not only did she do a phenomenal job, but it was such an opportunity to allow and elevate youth voice. We want to see this curriculum in schools not only throughout Seattle, but throughout Washington State and throughout the country. Olivia right now is uh, in law school and theology school. She'd like to be a judge and a preacher. Heart, equity, justice. It takes a village and we really appreciate the fast pitch community and I want to thank you for that. My name is Terrell Dorsey. I'm the founder CEO of an organization called Unleash the Brilliance. My fast pitch experience was amazing. To be on that stage in front of all those people, powerful people, well-meaning people, it was like almost a dose of nuclear energy. Even though Fast Pitch was a few years ago, Deborah Drake, who was my coach back then, winning coach I might add, still contributes you know, to our organization. She, she provides coaching, she provides leadership, writing, marketing, she is on the team. By helping our students to be successful, the collateral positive consequences that the parents do better, the community 
benefits at large. We have partners that have embraced us. They find funny to keep our students on the track. We've had some great wins over these last few years. We have schools that are knocking on our doors. We have Best Starts for Kids, a King County organization who just delivered to us a great grant to support kids in two different school districts. We've had community organizations who have provided money for us to be connected during the summer for internships. We pay the students a stipend for their participation around environmental justice, fruit distribution and, and harvesting. It's been wonderful. For all of you listening in the audience, please know from the bottom of my heart that your support for this organization has a tremendous ripple effect. I have changed many students to be on the path of progress to do better, to see a positive view of their future. That would not have happened if it wasn't for you. Thank you. Let's give another round of applause for our Where Are They Now folks. And it's wonderful to truly see that what we're doing is actually having an impact and being able to move forward. So um, tonight we've been able to see our 11 finalists. Um, what we haven't been able to see is the other wonderful people who were able to um, push forward their, their great work that they're doing. And so we wanted to introduce you to our other 2018 semifinalists. So they're going to come to the stage, um, introduce themselves, and we just want to give them a loud round of applause for the, all their continued effort and work. And you will be able to give to them and learn more about them at the reception in just a few um, after the judges come back and deliberate and we give away our awards for tonight. So I'd like to welcome to the stage, beginning with Audley, um, our 2018 SVP Fast Pitch semifinalist. Hi, I'm Jenna, CEO and founder of Audley. We are on a mission to eliminate farm waste in the field breathing new life into odd produce, creating a new way to farm and feed the future. So come see our booth, thanks. Greetings, my name is Nura Yunus, founded African Women Business Alliance. We are a data, mission, and community-driven practice model led by and for black women diaspora. Our mission is to provide African women, immigrants, and black women diaspora with holistic approach and culturally responsive tools required to start, grow, and scale a business through professional business development training, one-on-one -on -one mentorship and coaching, uh, tailored workshops, access to seed capital, and marketplace. Thank you. Hi there. I'm Pedro Perez, Executive Director of Geeking Out Kids of Color a POC-led nonprofit that teaches kids uh, computer science through a racial and gender lens, uh, like coding through the Kiki Challenge or even through storytelling. Uh, thank you, and we look forward to seeing you in the reception hall. Thanks. Hey, everyone. My name is Leonovsky. I'm an executive director of Restartup Academy, a Washington Ventures the Five Ventures chapter, and what we do in Unlock Untapped Startup and Business Potential Behind the Prison Walls and Beyond. And what we do is we help people, men and women across this wonderful state, to hustle harder. <laughs> Come to prison with me sometime. Thank you. Hi. I'm Luis Garcia, CEO and president of Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Puget Sound. Dream with me for a second and just imagine if every single kid fulfilled their potential in life, regardless of obstacles in life and things that hold them back. Our new program is Mentor You, and it's a one-to-one -one mentoring program that connects students to the resources and the mentoring and the skills to succeed in college and in career in the future. Good evening, my name is David Bestock. I'm the executive director of the Delridge Neighborhoods Development Association. DNDA integrates art, nature, and neighborhood to build and sustain a dynamic Delridge. We work in affordable housing, youth arts programming, and environmental restoration and education, primarily in Southwest Seattle, but beyond. And we're honored to be part of uh, SVP Fast Pitch this year, promoting our new restorative justice program in partnership with uh, an alternative program of Seattle Public Schools. So come on by the booth and learn more. Thanks so much. Hi. 
Hi, I'm Kathleen Hosfeld. I'm the Executive Director for Homestead Community Land Trust. Homestead disrupts the historic, systemic, economic, and institutional barriers, uh, uh, barriers to owning a, a safe, healthy, and affordable home, barriers that disproportionately impact people of color. We build and rehab homes, we make and keep them affordable, we support homeowner success. Our vision is to rapidly scale our growth, uh, the growth of our portfolio through innovative partnerships because every home we make affordable creates a new economy for housing and remains affordable forever. It's an economy based on equity and opportunity that serves this generation and many generations to come. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Ian Yeagle, and I am the Social Circus Program Director at the School of Acrobatics and New Circus Arts, also known as Senka down in Georgetown. As one of the nation's largest circus schools, we are dedicated to using circus arts for social change and personal transformation, and our mission is to improve the mental, emotional, and physical health of children of all ages, backgrounds, and abilities by engaging them in the joyous creativity of acrobatics and circus arts. And tonight, I invite you to join us later at the Intellectual House for some play and to hear about how circus can change lives and communities. Thank you. Hello, I'm Kate Holman. Um, I'm the program director for UPower. We're a nonprofit providing trauma-informed fitness and wellness classes to underserved high schools that do not have PE or sport and serve incarcerated youth inside King County Juvenile Detention. And we are hoping to launch an after-school program in the near future. Thank you. Good evening, I'm BJ Stewart with Urban Impact. I serve as their chief operations officer we live out our mission by partnering with families and communities to break the cycle of poverty. And that's from a social perspective, from a, uh, and also from a material perspective and from a spiritual perspective. I also lead our Small Business Accelerator where our goal is transforming local entrepreneurs so they can transform the communities where they work and live. Thank you. Let's give another round of applause for our wonderful semifinalists. Yes, they will be available at the reception to learn and talk more, and so thank you again. And while I don't have any favorites, it's very likely if I get asked to come back and host next year that this jacket and flower may be what I wear. Uh, <laughs> Maybe like more of a red, you know, it's, it's, it's red with the black, maybe I hear it's slimmy. Um, and so we'll, we'll go from there. I don't want to do, there we go, make sure we don't have any feedback. And so coming next to the stage is a person I have the privilege and honor to introduce. Fast Pitch is just a, a portion of what SVP does here in the region and across the world, really. Um, but the leadership here um, that works is a gentleman that I've had the privilege to know um, for over 20 years. I was in his wedding. I'll tell you all about that story because there's a story to me being in his wedding um, and his back going out before he gave his nuptials. But be that as it may, um, he is a wonderful leader here in the Northwest and he is the executive director um, of this wonderful organization that we have come to know. And so please welcome to the stage Mr. Solon McCurdy. <laughs> I'm going anywhere. I'm going anywhere. <laughs> no, I was supposed to walk off. So, before I say anything, can you all join me in giving Marcus a huge oh. round of applause? Come on, give me more than that. Give me more than that. Marcus is like on his best behavior tonight. He is being way too humble. So, thank you, brother. Really, love you. Appreciate you. Um, also, just want to thank all of you for being here. This is our first year in the, at the University of Washington in Kane Hall, so thank you all for being here tonight. Give yourselves a round of applause. Um, I would have joined you a little bit earlier for the welcome when our board chair, Bob Woods, welcomed you all, but I was coming back from Detroit, which is a wonderful city, by the way, uh, but it was cold. It was so much warmer. I was so happy when I got here. 
Um, and I also had to pick up my lovely daughter, Nia. Just wait, honey, just wait. Uh, so she's my date for tonight. Uh, but again, thank you all for being here. And, and before I get into my remarks about SVP and the work that we do, I would be remiss if I did not give it up for all of our board members and partners who were in the room. Would you please stand? And in addition to that, thank you all for being here. In addition to that, I have to give it up. I, I'm just biased. I feel like I have one of the best teams in this region. I need every staff member to stand up. Please, if you're, if you're backstage, come out front real quick. Just wave hello. All the staff, SVP Seattle, please don't be shy. You guys are way too humble. Come here. Where are you at? Where are you at? And in particular, I'm going to embarrass this individual. Where's Jamisa? Jamisa Gorley, come here. Jamisa, please come here. Come on. Come here. No, 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 no. Please come get your house. This is why Fast Pitch is so amazing. Please give it up for Jamisa. She absolutely hates every time I do that, so I'm going to be in trouble later. Um, but again, thank you for being here, and thank you for sharing this special night with us. You know, if, if you have really enjoyed this evening, I, I, that is a treat for me and, and a joy for me. And I want to let you know that SVP Fast Pitch is just part of our work. It's just a, it's a piece of what we do in the last eight years. Uh, but at the core of our work, SVP Seattle has been around for 20 years, and we are now global in terms of having over 40 affiliates internationally uh, through our international affiliates. But the core of SVP's work is really about this idea of bringing together engaged philanthropists to really create meaningful change in our community. Because we know that while philanthropy sometimes is just rooted in this idea of investing money and giving money to causes, it really can't stop there. So the unique approach about SVP really shows up in two ways that I want to share with you quickly. One is that in some ways, we are a nonprofit service entity. We have the blessing of engaging many people like you in this audience in philanthropy education, in a unique experience to help you as individuals get activated in your communities and think about what it means to not only contribute your money, but think about how your time and your talent and your contributions as volunteers, as board members, as coaches, as active participants who bring your skills to organizations who may not have the capacity otherwise to succeed is given by all of you. And so that is really the special sauce of what we do. In addition to that, we are one of the few nonprofit organizations, few funders in this community that gift multi-year general operating grants, typically to small and mid-sized nonprofits who would not otherwise receive those dollars. When you think about the large scape and, and scope of funding in philanthropy, there's a very small percentage, under 20%, that actually goes to general ops. And so SVP is very special in playing in that space. And those go for four or five years to organizations to help them think about the things like, that they really need, like finance, resource development, communication, strategy, the core that helps these services and agencies give to their communities in very unique and special ways. And so that's part of what we do, and that's why we stand out. And so when you think about this work, it's not only about the individuals, because all of you can pay an individual contribution, all of you can show up as skilled volunteers for organizations, but part of what we've also recognized in this work is that we cannot do this alone, that there truly is a collective responsibility in philanthropy and in moving a kind of a social agenda forward for our community. And so when you think about larger issues like student homelessness or transit and mobility, or economic mobility. We've also taken the next step to invest in organizations that are looking at collaborations and thinking about how can they regionally impact certain causes. And so part of what we do is work with other funders, other nonprofits, the business community, and the chamber to think about how do we activate a collective response to some of these larger issues. Because when you think about the impact that we could have and that we have had while it has done quite a bit for this community in the last 20 years, I will tell you that there are very pervasive disparities that still exist in this community, particularly for people of color and low-income status. And you've probably heard some of that tonight, and that was by design. Because even though philanthropy plays a unique role in contributing to our community, philanthropy in its essence was built out of wealth inequality. 
There were a mass amount of folks who gained a lot of wealth, some of it on the backs of black and brown people, quite frankly. And so in many ways, sometimes we've even done a disservice to the communities that we aim to serve. So we at SVP, with all of you, are committed to doing more. We're committed in the next couple of years to really think about how do we help individuals not only get activated in their communities, but really become this next generation of philanthropists that lead with this evolved idea of what racial inequality means, what does it mean to address implicit bias, what does it mean to address power and privilege in the dynamics of philanthropy. Because when you have power, that gives you the ability to change the rules. And I would love to see this community in particular change the rules for the success of individuals who are marginalized and victimized in ways that does not give them the agency that they deserve. You can clap. <laughs> I, heard, I heard like an amen come from here. I wasn't going to say anything. So we want to spend time doing that with all of you, right? We want to take time to not only talk about contributions, to take time to talk about the inequities and social justice issues that are in our community, individually, with the organizations we support and sponsor, and collectively with other, re other uh, groups and, and across this region. So if you have enjoyed what you have experienced tonight, I encourage you to take a bigger step than that. Don't let your investment in here tonight. I want you to think about over the course of all of these innovators, the 20 plus that you've met, what does it look like for you to continually support them and engage with them and invest in them in ways that not only make this one idea go to scale, but actually make their services and supports and their resources sustainable for the betterment of our community? What does it look like for you in this moment to say you want to become an SVP partner and really engage in this philanthropy education to become a, a better steward in community. What does it look like for you tonight to actually tell James and say, you know what, I was so lit tonight that I'm going to become a coach next year and claim it tonight and not have her chasing down mentors six weeks before the, the event. What does it look like for you to actually give back and contribute now? I encourage you to take that opportunity to give, support, get engaged, come see me. I can sign you up. I have no problem. <laughs> and before I leave, if I can get this big iPad to work, or whatever it is, Surface, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, see, look, Marcus is the one who cracks those. I, I have an Apple bias. I am sorry. Jane Broom and others, Brad, they're going to be mad at me at Microsoft, but that's okay. It's all love. <laughs> Sorry, Jane. Um, I should say that the, the very best part of the evening is where you all will get to join us at a reception afterwards to have the opportunity, as you heard, to meet with all the innovators, hear more about their programs, get to know them one-on-one. -on -one. In addition to that, we are so great, uh, kind of blessed to have uh, Chef Christy Brown, I don't know if she's in the room, if she is, she could stand up, but Christy Brown from That Brown Girl Cooks, if you haven't yet, give it up. You definitely do not want to miss that. Um, and you'll be joining us in the Intellectual House, which I haven't been on campus for 20 years, um, until my age, but it's a, it's a gathering space that really is in honor of um, American Native and Alaska Native uh, individuals and communities, and it's a gathering space for faculty, students, and staff. So you will have the treat of sharing that space this evening. We will have volunteers helping direct you back, because it's a little dark, um, just so you know where to go and you feel like you are in the right space later this evening. But again, I, I invite all of you to stay engaged, spend time with us, learn more about SVP, have some great food, and really take this evening moving forward to become uh, more committed community stewards. With that, I thank you for being here, and I will turn it back to Marcus. Have a good night. All right. So now we get to make a decision around some of the wonderful 18 uh, groups we've gotten to see tonight. Again, these are only for the nonprofits, um, not for the for profits. Um, and so I want you all to pull out your cell phones. I should see it light up. It should be like a Grateful Dead concert or, or yeah, you see, you didn't think I knew about Grateful Dead, did you? Um, <laughs> we made some judgments. Um, pull out your phone. You want to put in, H you don't have to put in the HTTP, but if you need to, go for it. Um, Bitly backslash audience choice. 
Um, you should be able to open your browser. You should be able to see a list of the choice of war selections um, and then go from there. So this would be a great time to maybe, um, I'm gonna do a teacher trick here um, as you're pulling out your phone. If you don't have a phone, share, give somebody the two cents it took for your rate, whatever it is that was working. Uh, you're shaking your head up there, it's not working. Uh, make sure we try it again. Put in the HTTP maybe. <laughs> it's case sensitive, thank you so much. I, 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 tried, I tried it earlier myself, I was like, I know it works. So it's case sensitive, so make sure you put in the capital A, capital C, 18, um, we should have that. Um, again, maybe, uh, again, a teacher trick, talk, turn to your left, turn to your right if you're having a, just a tough time deciding who to choose from. Um, talk to a neighbor. If you don't have a cell phone, borrow your neighbor's cell phone. Make sure they give it back to you. Um, those are important things um, to have. So make sure we have that moving forward. This is your opportunity to make our choice, which I think is, is one of the coolest things of the evening. We are all um, going to be able to contribute to an organization being able to move forward and grow, you know, be because of your wonderful vote. Um, and what a week to do it. There's been a lot of voting this week. And these will have no recounts, I promise you. Um, this, <laughs> what we log in today is, is what's going to happen. So we appreciate that. So as we let the judges finish up um, and you're finished and doing a little voting, we're going to make sure um, to let you know shortly when the voting um, is shut off and then what we have for the rest of the evening is we're going to give the, all of the awards out, concluding with the audience award, and then we are going to make our way to the intellectual house, as Solon said, and mix and mingle um, and network with each other. So continue to vote. We'll be out in just a moment, and we are going to begin the awards presentation. And now we are officially, I counted it down in my head, we are officially closed for the audience portion. And so thank you so much. And um, I just want to give you, give yourselves a round of applause. Again, we had 100% participation, um, if the numbers were correct. Looking back there quickly, so give yourselves a round of applause. That means, that means everybody has a cell phone and or somebody voted twice. Again, we'll come back to this later. Um, I hear Jeff Sessions is available, maybe for some Attorney General stuff. And so. Um, give us a few more moments as we calculate the votes, and we will be right back um, to announce our award winners. Thank you all so much again. It is that time of the evening. We've heard the wonderful pitches. We have seen incredible, incredible, passionate um, presentations. We have seen how fast you can text. We've seen, and thank you so much for, the, uh, for letting me know the things were case sensitive. Um, we've been a part of it, and now it is the, the moment we've been waiting for, beyond the, the happy hour afterwards, which is giving the awards um, for our SVP Fast Fits presentation. So I want to once again thank the judges. Um, so give them a round of applause. I truly do not envy them as they had a harder job than American Idol or people on The Voice and they had less cooler chairs. Um, and so we had to really deal with that so we appreciate their support. So um, first up for the awards. Are we ready? Yeah. All right. We have the SVP Fast Pitch Grow 50 Consortium Award. I'm joined by our friends at Go 50 that have chosen two innovators selected from the full cohort that will each receive $70,000 worth of consulting services from the 14 firms within the consortium, offering specialized consulting services including finance, engineering, legal, marketing, and more. All right, so here we go. The Grow 50, Grow 50 Consortium Award goes to Oddly and Rebuilding Together Seattle. Congratulations. Congrats. Thank you so much. All right. So, our next one is our startup 
for profit, best pitch award. I'm real nervous on this part. Like, you don't want to blot out. <laughs> I don't want to Steve Harvey this one. Uh, all right. So <laughs> I really, I had to, to calm, <laughs> I had to calm myself down. All right, here we go. Our Startup for Profit Award is presented in part by our friends at GoDaddy. In addition to the Best Pitch Award, the for-profit winner will also receive $4,000 worth of management development training from Uniquely HR. And the for-profit Best Pitch Award goes to Circled In. Our next one is for our startup nonprofit. All right. So, our startup nonprofit award is presented in part by our friends at Premier Blue Cross. So, we have two, we have a runner up and a, and a winner on this one. So, in second place, our startup nonprofit award goes to Elixir. And for our startup nonprofit, again, brought to our friends by Premier Blue Cross, our first place startup nonprofit award goes to Dignity for Divas. Congrats. <laughs> <laughs> to all of our to all of our winners walking around with big checks, remember there's college students around here. Don't lose these big checks. I could pay for some food at the hub. Just a couple things though. The hub's expensive now. Uh, all right, awesome. <laughs> I'm just telling you, it is. Um, our established nonprofit award is presented in part by our friends at BECU. So we appreciate them. So this is for our established nonprofits. In second place, our established nonprofit award goes to Tech Brigades Girls. In addition to the cash grant awarded, the first place established nonprofit winner will also receive 80 hours of consulting services from our value partners at Point B worth $20,000. So in, in addition to what our first place winner gets, we appreciate our partners at Point B. Our first place established nonprofit award goes to Seattle Against Slavery. Lastly, the audience choice. This is, this is you. This is what you pressed in your wonderful numbers for, and again, all your service providers. Um, and even if you use somebody else's phone, this is brought to you by you, so we appreciate it. Joining me on stage to present the audience choice award is our friends from the Paul G. Allen Philanthropies. 
So we appreciate it. We appreciate all the wonderful work um, that every philanthropist here has. But, but in recent uh, news with Mr. Paul G. Allen, we appreciate it. So our audience choice, not ours, your audience choice um, for tonight. And so the winner is, you got a drum roll. You did this. Drum roll, please. Our Audience Choice Award goes to Seattle Against Slavery. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's please hear for all of our innovators and, win and winners tonight, our semifinalists, each and every one. What an incredible evening it's get, been of giving, of giving back. I hope that you've, you've tweeted, that you've Facebooked, that you've Instagrammed, that if, if you've MySpace, I appreciate that even more. I appreciate you letting everybody know the fantastic work that we're having in these regions. Again, there's so many powerful organizations. Please feel free to give to them. It has been my honor to MC the evening. Please join us at the Intellectual House. Uh, mix, mingle, meet a friend, meet an old friend, maybe make up with an, uh, an old enemy over Angel Food, over Angel Network, uh, Red Wine, Sundries. There'll be wonderful things. Learn more about these organizations and our semifinalists. We thank you. Have an incredible evening, and we'll see you shortly at the Intellectual House.